This video is sponsored by Squarespace, the best all-in-one platform for building your online presence or running your business. Hello everyone, this is Kalimara here. Welcome back to my channel, or if you're new to the pond, go ahead and take a dive. You might like it here. This video is a bit different because it's more of a rant video, which I haven't done in a while. I started writing a script for this video back in June of 2021, but I just kept putting it off because I couldn't decide what my angle was, and then Jiran Jade Zhao dropped her own movie-length three-part video giving a platform to Southeast Asian voices about the movie, and almost everything I wanted to say had already been said. But there are a couple of things that I haven't really seen anyone talk about, so I wanted to discuss that here as an artist, writer, and Disney fan from the culture that the movie is derived from. I am Indonesian, ethnically, racially, and as a nationality, though you'd probably be more familiar with Bali, which is the most popular destination in Indonesia, but it is only one out of 17,000 other islands. I am Sundanese, which is the ethnic group of people from West Java, and I was born and raised in Indonesia all my life before I moved to Australia to pursue my bachelor's degree. So I feel like if there's anything I have a right to speak on, it is this movie, and Disney is a multi-billion dollar company who made millions on the movie anyway, so it's not like I'm punching down here. After my first watch of it, there was just something about the movie that felt off to me. But I couldn't really put my finger on it because I did like it. I thought it was pretty inoffensive and did a decent job at portraying a general surface level overview of Southeast Asian cultures. Which is partly why I had so much trouble figuring out my take on the movie. Because it's not the worst thing ever, but there's also this pervasive feeling of wrongness that does warrant closer examination. Because it's not just one thing that bleeds out into the other aspects of the movie. It's several things mashed together that created a problem that's difficult to pull apart and examine one by one. Because it's so indistinguishable, you just can't make heads or tails of it just like the setting of the movie itself. So for the sake of organization, and because I've been watching way too many Jenny Nicholson videos, I think I'm going to arrange my thoughts in a convenient numbered list, guiding you through my mental journey of trying to form an opinion on this movie, I guess, so that I know what to say to people if anyone ever comes up to me and asks, Hey Callie, so what did you think of the first Southeast Asian Disney princess? And I can just show them this video. Hey, you're probably watching this as background noise while you're drawing, right? Maybe you draw for a hobby. Maybe you're going to art school or maybe you're a professional artist looking for more work opportunities. If you're any of these things, then Squarespace can help give you a place to compile your art in an aesthetically pleasing manner or build a kick-ass portfolio to help progress your art career. You can also display posts from your social media to keep things connected and it even comes with automatic image scaling. I'm using Squarespace to organize my lore pieces for my original story Wild Word and once it's finished, it'll be a handy guide for you guys to learn more about the setting and follow along with the story. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Kalimara or use code Kalimara to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thought 1. I think Raya should have been a musical. So while examining my thoughts further and comparing Raya and the Last Dragon to newer releases like Encanto, the first thing I realized is that this movie could and should have been a musical. Dance and music are a significant cultural aspect shared among all Southeast Asian countries that the movie just completely brushed aside. When I realized this, I realized just how little research actually went into the directing and production of Raya. Raya is the equivalent of if Moana was only shown dancing the hula in the end credits. And you might be thinking, Kali, Raya is set in a harsh post-apocalyptic environment. There's no time for singing or dancing. Well, Les Miserables is literally about people meeting tragic ends during the time around the French Revolution and guess what? It was a musical. 
If anything, the story could have warranted a much more epic soundtrack, like John Powell's How to Train Your Dragon kind of epic. Raya could have been an incredible musical incorporating the sounds of Southeast Asia. We have a lot of unique traditional instruments that could have been used for more than just background scores. And with the flair of Southeast Asian instruments and melodies, it would have given the song so much more character that could have become some of the best music Disney has ever produced. But instead, well, they made Dragon Elsa. Disney is at its best when it tells story through song. Moana is a great example of this, especially given how important their dance and music is to Polynesian culture. This is also the case in Southeast Asia. It's a very big aspect of our heritage and yet it's barely showcased in the movie, even before the kingdoms fell to ruin. The most we see is a few performers playing music for the big banquet between the five kingdoms and not a single dancer or singer, which I just find very difficult to believe. Much of our most impressive traditional clothing is worn specifically for these dances. I can't quite speak for other cultures, but music is how Indonesians tell our traditional stories. We even have our own style of singing called nyinden. Narrators or dalang of wayang performances will sing the narration of the story they're telling with improvised melodies. This is completely up Disney's alley, but they completely dropped the ball. Instead, they replaced it with this spy-slash-martial arts movie theme that felt more like old-school kung fu movies, which, funnily enough, is more relevant to East Asia. So really, they should have done that for Mulan, but they didn't. So why did they do that here? Also, there is something to be said about Disney choosing a Chinese-Korean-American actress to voice a literal god of this world, because Southeast Asians already get looked down upon and discriminated against by Northeastern Asians. Just look at how Lisa from Blackpink gets treated by Korean netizens for being Thai, despite already fitting into their beauty standard. So making an actress of that ethnicity the god over the Southeast Asian world just doesn't sit right with me. Especially when Southeast Asians themselves already perceive Northeastern Asians to be their beauty standard and treat them like gods in their own right. It's just furthering a harmful mindset in my opinion. But then again, the movie's foundations were already incredibly flawed from the moment they decided to mash several Southeast Asian countries together, use it only as an aesthetic and twist them to a near unrecognizable degree, and then slap a generic story onto it that contradicts itself time and time again. If you want a more in-depth explanation as to how and why, please watch this video by Shafrila's Productions because he explains it really well in his video. Thought 2. Wow, they were not qualified to make this movie. Honestly, as hard as the movie tried, the setting of the story could only vaguely feel like Southeast Asia. If this movie was a carbonated beverage, it would be LaCroix, very watered down with an echo of culture. Because just like LaCroix isn't technically a soda, Raya and the Last Dragon isn't supposed to be about any culture in real life. It's definitely not, and I don't think it was ever meant to be POC representation the same way Encanto, Coco, or Moana had been. Heck, they even decided to make up a whole new language for Kumandra when they literally have hundreds they could have used from the countries they drew inspiration from. Not to mention, they completely missed the opportunity to feature the extremely diverse flora and fauna in Southeast Asia that you literally can't find anywhere else in the world in favor of completely made up ones like giant caracals, which isn't even native to Southeast Asia, and fart bugs. This movie is so far removed from the peoples it was trying to represent that if you just changed the names of the characters and their clothes, people would sooner think it was Disney trying to do animated Indiana Jones than a Southeast Asian Disney princess. As the saying goes, people tend to write what they know. And I think it deserves mentioning that none of the directors of Raya and the Last Dragon were even remotely Southeast Asian. The movie was directed by Don Hall, Carlos Lopez Estrada, Paul Briggs, and John Ripa. 
out of the eight writers listed on IMDb, only two of them were Southeast Asians, who are also listed at the very top of every credit to make the movie seem authentic, I guess. But even then, I don't think they had much control over how the movie turned out. And if you're wondering why any of this information matters, it's because the attachment and involvement in the culture matters. These people who had likely never even consumed any type of Southeast Asian media before were now writing for five countries worth of culture and nuance. It would be difficult to accurately capture the essence and spirit of one country you're not familiar with as an outsider, let alone five. Like they barely scraped through with Frozen. Imagine if on top of Norway, they also decided to take on Denmark, Finland, and Iceland and just jammed it all together into Arendelle. That's why Raya's journey through Kumandra ended up feeling like a tourist journey through a foreign country. We never see her participating in any cultural practices, earning a living through hard labor like most of the working class back in ancient times, or exhibiting any knowledge of the land. Seriously, how did she survive for that long if she never even worked a job or cultivated her own crops? She mostly coasts through the landscapes, gets dined by the locals, and watches cultural performances, much like a tourist would when on a tour and travel to a foreign country. If you want to see a culture creatively interpreted into high fantasy through the perspective of its own people, go watch Wonderland Indonesia by Alfi Rev. It is nothing less than a love letter to the people of Indonesia as a celebration of our culture to commemorate the 76th anniversary of our independence. Each time I watch this video, I keep thinking to myself, this is what Raya could have been. Instead of the opening sequence that we got in the movie, just imagine this sweeping shot of the landscape of Kumandra showcasing this gorgeous terrain, unique plants and animals, accompanied by a gentle humming, giving you a feeling of mystery and wonder. We pan to the Castle of Heart, specifically the royal training grounds, and the music shifts to this triumphant battle song. Enter Raya dressed in ceremonial wear as she steps onto the field. Her father comes from the other side of the stage, and they both enter a Panchak Silat stance, and they spar, accompanied by the music that we now see is being played by performers in the background of their battle. And as the music ends and the battle comes to a close, the two bow to each other, and at the audience that had come to watch their performance, gathering from all corners of the village. It sets the tone, it shows Raya being involved in her culture and community, and it references real-life Silat performances, which is not only a martial arts, but an art form that goes hand-in-hand hand with music. But then I pause, and I realize that Raya could never be this, because Raya is not Indonesian. She's not Filipino, she's not Malaysian, she's not Thai or Vietnamese, she's not even Southeast Asian at all. She's Kumandran, a fictional fantasy world that is about as real as Arabia from Aladdin. Aside from the fact that combining all these cultures together removes the identities and individuality of the cultures it represented, to me, it's also like Disney is saying, yeah, you guys are all the same, right? Like, a story set in just Malaysia or just Thailand wasn't significant enough to warrant its own movie. High fantasy can be a great conduit, but in this case, it genuinely feels like an easy cop-out to not actually put in any groundwork. But I will say, the crew really excelled in incorporating what they did experience of the culture. The best parts about this movie were the small moments in between, the details that weren't really meant to stand out because I don't doubt they must have experienced or been taught this during their visit to their reference countries. Like Raya taking off her shoes before entering the sacred dragon spirit chamber, 
The way the characters sit, the aggressive hospitality, sharing meals and food in general, and how the characters suddenly talk about being hungry or asking if someone has eaten yet. I also like that Tuk Tuk sounds like a motorcycle when he rolls around because that's pretty much the most common noise in any sea country. Thought 3. Am I the target audience? I think there's something to be said about the actual target audience of the movie. I don't actually think Raya was meant for Southeast Asians who grew up in Southeast Asia at all. Rather, the community of Southeast Asians in America who were born and raised with American culture. Just the opening scene alone made me feel like I was watching a Western movie. Western as in cowboys, mixed with James Bond. After all, a mysterious lone stranger riding into town, running from her past and is instantly distrusted by everyone living there, but ends up saving the town from destruction is probably more familiar to most Americans than folk tales from Southeast Asian countries. Like, I highly doubt any of you have ever heard of Timun Mas or the legend of Niroro Kidul. Heck, Raya is even dressed like a cowboy too, don't you think? That realization was what really made me put this video off for so long because at one point I just figured, well this movie isn't for me. But then they released Encanto, and despite not even being remotely Colombian, this movie spoke to me more than Raya ever did. So maybe this isn't a target demographic thing, maybe it's just a bad writing thing. Maybe it's a case of biting off more than you can chew and being woefully underprepared for the depth you were diving into. Which is really sad because I doubt we'll be getting another Disney animated movie set in Southeast Asia for a very, very long time. And don't get me wrong, I've waited my entire life to see a Southeast Asian Disney princess. Heck, even back then, little Callie was like, they'd never do that. They would never make an Indonesian Disney princess. I don't think they even know Indonesia exists. And I really, really tried to like Raya on my first viewing. But to me, it just fell short. It might sound selfish of me, but I wasn't expecting to have to share a movie that was meant to be about quote unquote my culture with like 10 other cultures and countries and needing to play Where's Waldo in every scene just to be like, hey, I think that's a reference to my culture. And you know what? Disney can and should do better. Disney is known for its mind-blowing attention to detail. They animate every single strand of hair on their character's head. They even drew in every single stitch on Elsa's dress and detailed every single snowflake in Frozen. Yet, they couldn't lend that same attention to detail to Raya? Sounds pretty sus to me. Thought 4. Where is the fashion? What is this? What am I looking at? For those of you who aren't Southeast Asian and you're not familiar with Southeast Asian culture, Southeast Asians love patterns. We intricately detail every single carving on temples and even patterns on clothes. Once again, this should be right up Disney's alley, and yet we see so much plainness in this movie. Plain clothes, despite things like batik very evidently being a thing. Plain temples, plain walls, plain, plain, plain. Of course, the biggest offender here is the leader of Fang's dress. I have never seen a dress like that before in my entire life and evidently so did the rest of Southeast Asia. Nobody was able to recognize this lady's dress and the fact that it's so painfully plain is a downright crime. We don't have dresses that blank in Southeast Asia. It looks more European than it does even remotely Asian. And I'm going to be speaking specifically on Fang from this point on because Fang is clearly heavily inspired by Bali and as an Indonesian, I think I have a say in this. So first things first. The background characters in Fang wear more accurate clothing than the plot relevant characters. So Disney does know what the clothes look like, they just chose not to use it? 
Bali was the last stronghold of the Majapahit Kingdom, which was once the largest kingdom in Indonesian history and possibly Southeast Asian history because its territory encompassed the entire Indonesian archipelago as well as Malaysia, Brunei, and if you look at how people in the Majapahit Kingdom dressed, especially its royalty, you'd find them adorned by gold jewelry, flowers, and the most intricate patterns of all. Yes, it sounds vain and doesn't conform to modern standards of strong women, but that's how it is in our culture. Which is why the hair they chose for Namari and her mother is such a heinous crime to me. Like, I normally wouldn't care or mind that hairstyle in any other context, but in this context, it's completely wrong. In Indonesian culture, especially during ancient times like Majapahit times, like this movie setting, long hair is a sign of status for both men and women. They can style it to support the various headdresses in our traditional clothing, and it's not in our culture or tradition to shave our heads. In fact, the only time I could feasibly see this hairstyle is if the person is extremely poor or an outlaw or criminal of some sort because you don't have the means to keep longer hair clean and you're at risk of getting bugs, so it's easier to shave it off. This clearly isn't the case for Fang royalty. So when they showed up for the first time in the beginning of the movie and Namari was speaking to Raya about her kingdom, I legit believed her when she talked about how impoverished they were compared to the Heart Kingdom. She already said they couldn't even eat rice, which in hindsight could have been a manipulation tactic, but her look really sold it to me. She did look poor to me. When we do get to Fang, I fully expected it to look like a military camp in the middle of a harsh jungle, and seeing that it's actually very well developed actually gave me a shock. But even compared to the other denizens of Fang, those two women look so painfully out of place. To me, this hairstyle is too modern for the setting, and in the context of ancient Southeast Asian times, it actually makes them look like they're part of the working class as opposed to royalty. For traditional dances like Panyambrana, Balinese women will wear their hair down, pushed to one side over their shoulder. Their hair will often be adorned with flowers. So the artists saw this and decided, hmm, let's make it edgy, and then made them look like they came straight out of Cyberpunk 2077. It feels really out of place and foreign. And this is painful to me, because if anything, that hair is more reductive than just giving them headgear like this, which would have pinned their hair back and kept it completely out of their face. They could have fashioned the headdress into a helmet and it would have made them look more militaristic and elite. In fact, a lot of Balinese traditional clothing, like what they wear for the Legong dance, looks a lot like armor already. And this is just Bali. The current clothing they're wearing now looks more like something they should be wearing under their armor. Again, it's the lack of research and laziness. If they put them in armor, they would have needed to put in more effort and research into it and animating it, and it just wasn't worth it enough for them, I guess. Yes, we can definitely animate every thread on Elsa's dress, but putting the same amount of detail to Raya? You're asking too much. It feels like a charity case. We know what Disney is capable of, we know the amount of detail they can put into their animations and stories, but they didn't. And honestly, it's just really sad. Thought 5. The dragons should have stayed dead. I think that the narrative beat of not only reviving all the dragons that turned to stone, but bringing Sisu back to life after Namari shot her, diminished the message of the movie entirely. Major spoiler alert, but the theme running throughout the movie is trust, like they literally will not let you forget. It was trust that kept the dune at bay, and it was distrust that brought them back into the world. Essentially, the dune represented discord. Although the dragons created the crystal that managed to ward them away, it was ultimately their trust that made the magic work. And in the end of the movie, it was the main gang's trust in each other that put the gem back together and banished all of the dune. 
The message could have been that all they needed was each other, that they needed to have trust to keep everything from falling into discord, and that was the lesson they learned from Sisu and the other dragons that could be passed down as legends. Raya is a lot darker than other Disney princess stories, so I felt that this would have fit their genre perfectly. It's the harsh reality of things. Magic and wonder fades with time, but their stories always remain. It would also have signified a clear end to an era, and the beginning of a new one. With the dragons coming back, it just feels like… I don't know, they've gone back to where they started without any change or consequences. Yes, bringing the dragons back was visually more appealing, but it reversed the impact of their absence in the first place. Maybe instead of literally bringing them back, they could have been freed in a different way. Like, maybe the humans coming together to become Kumandra again allowed them to adopt their true forms as the water, the rain, mist, and light, but their stone forms remained, and over time, people would wonder if it was all made up based on these strange rock statues. That would have added so much more to their mystique, and it would have fit the kinds of stories we do tell in our culture. Allowing the dragons to physically exist with people makes them too tangible. It removes the mysticism, the spiritual and supernatural aspect of these stories, and takes it much too literally. It turns lore and mystery into fact and reality, and Disney probably knows this better than anyone, but fact and reality is boring. Like, if you discovered that unicorns are real and you could spot them and interact with them just as easily as deer, would that still make them special? No. They'd just be horses with horns and you know for a fact that they'd be mean to death, just like any other animal. Nothing is sacred. I don't know, Southeast Asian stories should have been perfect for Disney lore because it relates so strongly to nature and creating stories based on natural phenomena. Putting magic into something that might be considered mundane like rain or water. But here, Disney took the magic part and scrubbed the lore and mysticism behind it, making it very shallow as a result. It's very pretty, but pretty doesn't make a good story. All in all, the movie isn't bad by any means, but it also isn't anything spectacular. It doesn't resonate with me and I actually thought Raya's character barely changed or developed at all. By the end of it, all I could think was that the movie was okay. There are some sites and landscapes that are very familiar and they managed to get small nuances right, but the overall picture felt very empty and foreign. I wasn't attached to any of the characters and I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that it wasn't a musical. Disney is very good at developing characters through songs. They're I want songs, but because this movie wasn't a musical, Disney didn't seem to know how else to convey those story beats, and so they didn't. It's very pretty to look at, but it always feels like there's something missing. And funnily enough, it was heart. When I watched Raya, it was like seeing someone you thought you knew from behind, but then you tap them on the shoulder and they turn around and it's a total stranger. So how could they have avoided this? In my opinion, they should have hired more staff actually from those cultures and given them bigger input into the story. Like, at least have one Southeast Asian director in there, please. I guess once again, it comes back to who the target audience for the movie is and what the movie aims to do. If Raya was targeted for American audiences to introduce them to Southeast Asian culture, then yeah, it does a decent job, but if their intended purpose was to create something for their Southeast Asian audience, I think they missed the mark. It's funny, because while I was watching Raya, it felt less like I was learning about Southeast Asian culture through an American-driven media, and more like the movie was trying to introduce American culture through Southeast Asian media. It was weird. So what's my conclusion? Raya isn't offensively bad or unenjoyable, but it also barely scratches the surface of all the cultures it tries to represent. The animation is a bit questionable in the beginning, 
which was my least favorite part as well, but it gets better as the movie goes on and I genuinely love watching the dragons move. I don't know how I feel about their colors though, because they really stick out like a sore thumb against the more tropical setting, but maybe they were meant to stand out? I don't know. The landscapes are always gorgeous and I love the different building and housing designs in the movie. The fights were a bit lackluster to me though, but I really liked how I could identify the different fighting styles like Pencaksilat and Muay Thai. They just lacked impact. It's like the blows don't really have much weight and I think a lot of it had to do with the camera movement. It's very stable and calm and it doesn't match the scene very well. The costume design was questionable at best, but it's close enough. Actually, I feel like that probably summarizes my thoughts about this movie pretty well. It's close enough. But that is the end of the video. Thank you so much for watching all the way to the end. It took me such a long time to actually get this video out because I wasn't sure if I was really adding anything to the conversation. And then I thought, Actually, I don't care if it adds anything or not. I think I have a right to speak on this. So I did. And hopefully, I don't offend anyone by saying it. If you're also Southeast Asian, please let me know in the comments below what you thought of the movie. Or if you're not Southeast Asian, let me know what you thought of the movie in the comments. Did it make you feel like you were learning about this new culture? Or did it feel kind of like every other movie you've ever seen before. I'm very curious to hear how this movie is perceived by people who aren't part of the culture because I have a rough idea on what people who are part of the culture feel about this movie. That being that we think Disney should do better. <laughs> But yeah, I want to thank all my lovely pond dwellers for supporting me. If you want to become a pond dweller, please feel free to join my Patreon. The link is in the description. Also, thank you to everyone that sent me their amazing, lovely fan art. I especially enjoy the fan arts for my Wild Word story, which is my original take on Magical Girls. It's kind of a passion project I'm working on at the moment. If you want to hear more from me, then please join my Discord server, follow me on all my social media, check out my comic because that will make me really happy, and I will see you guys in the next video. Goodbye!